Hi folks, Rick Barabee here, live from Success Series with, oh, look at that, Mark Star. Say hello, Mark. Hello, hello. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. All right, Mark, so today we're going to talk as if you were a real estate agent. Remember those days? I do. It wasn't that long ago, was it? Well, let's, uh, yeah, it was kind of longer ago. <laughs> so, as a, okay, so give them a little history, and I think uh, people love when you tell the story of you started as an agent, then you were a manager, and now you're the owner. Give I would give them a little uh, rundown of the whole thing. All right, please. Uh, well, first, uh, glad to be here today. For those of you who were not in Success Series and coming uh, to us from Facebook Live, if you see some boxes and set up, that's because this is in the middle of teaching a class that we're doing virtually. And uh, Rick asked me uh, if he could interview me through as part of his class, because he does interviews through it, and I said, sure. So if you're seeing some of this, that's why. Um, all right, let me, let me kind of give you a little bit of a background, and then Rick, you can jump in and ask me any questions sure. uh, that you want me to answer. Um, I started in uh, 1985 uh, in getting my license. Uh, prior to that, I worked at um, the Las Vegas Hilton. Uh, I originally am from Chicago and moved out to Las Vegas to go to hotel management school. That's what brought me out here. Uh, hotel wasn't for me, and in uh, uh, 1985, decided to get my real estate license. I was a, a huge 21 years of age. Um, <clears throat> really took to the business like a fish to water. I really did enjoy it. A couple things I enjoyed is I could see that the harder you work, the more success you could have. And there was no ceiling uh, besides yourself. Um, I also learned very quickly and saw it around me that if you didn't respect this business and really work hard, you can make zero. So it really <laughs> depends on you. And that was okay. Um, I sold uh, for approximately seven years and I was very fortunate. Uh, I had a, uh, a few great managers through that time, but one of the assistant managers, uh, George Head, Right when I started, because coming out of the hotel business and really uh, out of college not too uh, long prior, um, I had no sphere of influence. Uh, my friends couldn't afford beer besides to afford a home. So that wasn't going to be a great waste, uh, place to start. So George told me, Mark, you need to meet people. I don't want you to do anything else but meet people. In fact, he donated me his farm area. He says, this is a farm area that I worked. Why don't you take it over? But you need to be out there getting face to face with people. And that's all I did. Uh, my whole life was getting face to face with people. And the other piece that he added, he says, I want you to commit to at least one face to face, new face to face meeting with people about buying a house or selling a house. So he helped me right from the beginning focus my efforts and focus my mindset to say, Mark, the only way you can determine a productive day is if you, one, are talking to new opportunities, and two, you actually have a meeting with somebody who's thinking about buying or selling. So that really directed me and um, it really helped me get springboard my career in, in a very big way. After selling for about seven years, the president of the company at that time was Mark Masevic and one of the owners. And he asked me if I'd be willing, they were opening up a new office, would I be willing to train um, for that office? I could still sell full time and that's where the bulk of my income was coming from, of course. So I said, no problem. It was on the opposite side of town. So I sold my house from where that it was at. Love Mark, really would do anything for him. He was just a brilliant leader. And uh, so I sold the house, moved to the other side of town, sold full time, and did trainings for the office. Well, about eight months after that, um, they made a change with one of the managers in one of the other offices, of course, on the opposite side of town that I just came from. And he asked me, would you be willing to take over that office? I'll allow you to grow it to as big as you want, uh, but I can't have you sell anymore. Um, and you know, at that time I would do a lot of units, carry about 50 listings at all times. But the difference was the average sales price was about $75,000. So we were able to sit down, come up with something that was a win-win, uh, as long as I could grow it. 
And that's really what started my management career. Um, and I guess that was in, that would have to be around 92, I believe. Uh, and uh, managed, got, we took the lowest producing office uh, to the highest producing office in three years. Uh, managed that office for a little bit over five years. And at that time, the president of the company, Mark Masevic, uh, I don't know, some of you may have heard this in the past, but got hurt in a skydiving accident. As crazy as that sounds. He was the jump master for the state of Nevada and got hurt, lived through it. Um, but at that time, we needed a general manager after Mark's accident. Um, and uh, I wrote up a seven-page report of why we needed it, um, how I could do it, if I had the opportunity to do it. I even said I would take a decrease in pay if we couldn't make the results happen. Um, Steve Schneider and Jack Woodcock at the time were the other partners gave me that opportunity and said okay go for it um, and that now even launched uh, uh, my career further about two years later one of the partners wanted to sell their interest and that's how I got in as ownership and um, about now I don't know we're probably closer to now about 97 closer to 99 in 99 um, the other partner wanted to sell out, and that's when we joined, at that time, the Prudential Network um, and created a new partnership, um, and I had been an owner from, I believe, 97, because I got in my first opportunity for ownership is when that first partner had sold out. Skip that part. So, first partner had sold, and then when we created the new company uh, in 99, uh, we were Prudential all the way up till 2000. Um, four, and in 2004, we, uh, we had eight years left on our Prudential contract, and uh, Prudential came to me because Berkshire had purchased it and said, would you be willing to end your uh, Prudential contract and move to a Berkshire Hathaway Home Services contract? I said, yes, I would. And that was nothing against Prudential. In fact, Prudential really uh, helped us grow in numerous ways, but you know what? I can say this, uh, there's not many companies, if any, like Berkshire Hathaway. And so I was thrilled uh, to be a member of the Warren Buffett family and the Berkshire Hathaway family. And uh, we've been Berkshire Hathaway ever since, which brings you up to today and this interview. So. so. Nice. Was that good? Okay. That was, that was very good. That was very good and um, completely accurate. Because <laughs> I've heard it before. All right. So um, that being said, um, so as a real estate agent, you know, we're talking about a lot of things. Let's pretend this is prior to uh, the COVID-19 thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how did you do your business? You mentioned um, you carried 50 listings and prior to getting into management, how did you do, how did you, how'd you come about being able to carry that many listings? Okay, so 80% of my business was listings, 20% were purchasers. And uh, uh, I've heard you say that before. Uh, the people that you made homeless uh, were very motivated uh, buyers because you just sold their house. So most of my buyers, not all, but most of my buyers came from my sellers. But so I felt this way, and I learned very early on that, you know what, um, you want to thrive, not survive, but you want to thrive in this business, you need inventory. Right. So I felt, okay, if I can get up to X amount of listings, regardless as they sell, because ultimately I want them all to sell, but if I could get a target and call that target 50 listings, Mark, all you have to do is stay at that number. If I can commit to myself and my business to stay at 50 listings, then I know my income is never going to be anything but flowers and roses. So that was a beautiful thing. And that's what I focused in on. So every single day, that's where my focus would be. In fact, there was a little joke that went around the office. Um, I was a movie buff, and I don't get to go as often, uh, and truthfully, probably not as into it as I was at that time, but for whatever reason, sitting in a dark theater with my popcorn and big drink relaxed me. And it, regardless of what the movie was, it, it just calmed me down and relaxed me. Well, I would go all the time. I mean, five times a week. It was amazing. And sales executives knew it, and they would come up to me and say, how are you doing all this business and truthfully, Mark, not to be rude, but all you do is go to the movies. And you know what the real answer was, is I did not gauge my day by hours. I gauged it by productive activities. And I knew 
And I switched up from one appointment a day later uh, uh, in my career to two. That, and now that's not easy. I would tell everybody, stay with that one. And, and I think other, other agents who have different ways of doing it, like contacts, and it works for you, go with that. This worked for me. I said to myself, all you have to do, Mark, is have two new opportunities of buyers or sellers, and in my case, like I said, 80% were sellers, and you know what, that's all you have to worry about, and keep your listings at 50 plus as they sell. And that was my singular focus, that's what I committed to, and it always protected me. And I remember, and this came to me writing our four-step business plan, I said, you know, Mark, if you're honest with yourself, you don't really focus on having a good year. You don't focus on having a good quarter. You don't focus on having a good month. You don't even focus on having a good week. All you worry about is having a productive day. And I knew if I had a pro many productive days, my months, my quarters, my years would all work out. Yep. I can verify to the movie buff thing because when we drove through the snowstorm, remember to Arizona Awards, yeah. you watched two movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, um, so, all right. So, give us the productive activities. Like, you know, I know that you were a door knocker and you handled expires and, and different things. Yeah. So, give us my, my main ways of driving business what was just that. It was uh, uh, door knocking was number one uh, um, for sale by owners and expired listings. And then over time, I would build my sphere. But there were so many things when I think back that I did so poorly on the marketing side, on the sphere side that I would change today that I know would catapult my business even further. But my main focus was door knocking uh, for sale by owners and expired listings. Okay. And if I could not get that appointment because I needed two a day, five days a week, I could always get in to preview a new for sale by owner. So that was my catch all. If I was tight I, and I just didn't have another meeting, I would always say, Mark, go see a new for sale by owner, and that would count as a new opportunity, and I would put them in my for sale by owner system. And sometimes you wouldn't even call it. You would just go over. No. Well, in door knocking, the beautiful thing about door knocking is you're out there. There's no wrong doors to knock on. So when I would do that, sometimes it would be a for sale by owner. No problem. It was easy. Right. All right, cool. All right, anything else should, they should know about your schedule when you were a uh, producing real estate agent? Um, you know what, I, I would, the only other thing I would say, I'm a very consistent person. So um, I learned early on too is I didn't have to do this much. I could do this much as long as I did it consistently and did not skip, I would win. You know, the tortoise and the hare. Yeah. Right. Well, think about that. The um, uh, two appointments every day, five days a week, you know, and there's, you know, 240 work days in a year. That's a lot of appointments. I mean, you can only get half of them and you're gonna have an incredible year. Correct, correct. And listen, no days are perfect. Sometimes you don't get to it. But right. see, in the big scheme of things, remember the successful people don't focus on what they don't get. They focus on what they're getting. So it, it doesn't bother you miss something because you know what, you have a crazy escrow, there's a problem, you deal with it. But it came back to, you know what, the next day, I knew. I didn't have to worry about anything else. I didn't add on what I missed the day before. I didn't get into any of that. What do you got? Two new appointments today. Yeah, and back in those days when we used to door knock, you didn't even have a cell phone to distract you. You just no. went out there door knocking. No, true. All right, so now it's, uh, you know, with everything we've got going on, you know, just because for time here, um, what, how would you be doing things differently today to be productive even with what we got going on? Okay, well, one thing, and it's a great question, what would we do differently? Here's the kicker. The First of all, I would make sure I understand that there's some things that though they tweak, they're really the same. Like one is communicating and talking to people. Doesn't matter if you're doing it from a landline, okay, okay, a brick phone that used to have the big cords, or your new cool cell phone, guess what? You're communicating with people. If I'm knocking on a door, I love the face-to-face -face communicate. You're communicating with people. Okay, you're doing a drop by, you're communicating with people. That is number one. I don't care what the environment is, we are people first before we're anything. None of us were boring a realtor. No one's like, oh, good, and expired. You know what, <laughs> it just doesn't work like that, okay? We're people first. And so you have to respect that. That's how you have your empathy. Because you're not thinking about what you're trying to share, you're really coming from, okay, what are they dealing with? What are their challenges? And how am I going to serve them? How am I going to help them? Well, guess what? This environment speaks to that perfectly. Mm -hmm. Understanding there's different challenges 
You know, I learned early on, and this is from numerous mentors that I had. I've been really blessed with many, many quality mentors in my life. And one that has been drilled into me is, Mark, assume nothing. Assume nothing. Don't take your experiences and say, aha, that's how the world's working. Wrong. My individual experiences are, is not a big enough litmus test to tell me what other people are thinking. You know what is? Asking each individual person and giving them the respect to say, what's going on, how are you doing, and how can I help? Guess what? Listen first, and you'll be amazed of the information that comes out, and guess what? Then your job is, you know what? No whining, no complaining about the market, no complaining about the situation. I understand what they're trying to accomplish, now how can I help? And that's really what it is today, no different. You may be communicating a little bit differently. You know, you're doing more virtual today than seeing people face to face as we are with the class. class. But guess what? We've got human beings over here learning, being educated, asking questions, getting better. Guess what? Heck, I could go back eight months and make the exact same statement. We're, we're the problem. We're the ones that become the problem because we take our own mindset and go, well, let me tell you what's going on. You know what? Stop. I didn't fall into that trap. I don't have to worry about what's going on. I have to worry about what's your job today, how are you going to communicate with people, ask good questions, relevant questions, come from you know this idea of fake it till you make it. I don't like that statement. I like to really be authentic. How are you doing? Okay, let them communicate to you. And yes. Sometimes it's just the 45 minute conversation. They haven't had a good conversation with anyone all month. You lent your ear and guess what? That's what they needed. They're not selling, they're not buying, but guess what? They needed you and you were there. Love that. That's what we do. That's how we connect. And then the next person says, hey, I hear there's no business going on. Is that true? Well, let me share some real stats with you. And I give them facts of record and they go, seems incredibly busy. Exactly. I was having a conversation with a sales executive last week, and at that moment in time, that market had taken 1,500 listings in nine days. Can't argue with that. I could give my opinion, it's busy, or I can show people 1,500 listings in that particular market in nine days. That's busyness. So it, it's that type of Yeah, and aspect. that's what Alberto was talking about this morning. He was giving exact numbers, and, uh, you know, like you said, you know, um, there's definitely business going on. Another good point he made was, in this time, if you're communicating with people, they're going to remember that you were talking to them in this time. Oh, no, absolutely. Listen, you know, and people are going through things. You know, even our company, and I, and I will say this, you know, I get a lot of questions like, hey, Mark, now that we're dealing with the coronavirus, is this going to slow down our, you know, our VAC 2.0 and our, our upgrades and our tech? Absolutely not. You know what? We can't use, just like we can't use excuses with the consumer in their needs, no way. In fact, as you see, just like with the independent contractor health insurance, we move that faster. So we have to look at ourselves and say, wait a minute, how are we going to execute effectively in this environment? Don't blame it on the environment. It's not about the environment. It's not about the market. It's us. And as long as we're honest with ourselves, don't make any excuses and say, okay, this is not an environment that I would have chosen without a doubt for a zillion reasons. However, I happen to be in this environment. There's going to be people who win in this environment and there's going to be people who don't win. I want to be on the side of the people who win. So let me ask you a question, Mark. What is your company going to do in this environment so you come out of this stronger than ever? That's the focus. And that works for every one of your individual businesses, that works for your clients. There's clients, and I've had conversations with people, I know you have, that are going through a really, really tough time. Bottom line is, find out what that situation is, and if you can add help or support to that, that's exactly what we should be doing. Right. Yeah, and you know, it's just, it's one of those times where there's also opportunities now, right? To learn things that you weren't doing before, and there's all kinds of things you can do. Well, listen, th this whole virtual business. Um, one, people uh, have asked me, agents have asked me, do you think we're gonna go all virtual later? Again, the sales executives within our organization and other organizations will take all the great things, okay, about the old way of doing things and all the great things about the new ways of doing things and we'll incorporate that together. Just like consumers, 
Buyers and sellers will say, you know what, Mark, exciting. I want everything you offered me in the past, relationships, communication, effectiveness, where you're executing, and I want all these other things. I want the best technology, I want the best support, I want to be able to communicate virtually as well as face-to-face. -face. So it will be an overall uh, uh, package that we offer in this new economy. And truthfully, I know this sounds crazy and I, and I don't want this taken out of context, I am certainly, um, you know, v very, not only empathetic, but just, I've had some very emotional conversations with people, let me say it this, and so there are people dealing with a really tough scenario. I think the government, you know, I don't care which side you're on, Republican, Democrat, whatever, is doing their very best in a very tough scenario, okay? Um, but separate from that, I am excited. I am learning, okay? as fast as you are on all these new opportunities that we can bring on that I have to admit, okay, on camera, do I feel I would have come up with some of the innovative ideas that we're coming up with right now without this happening? No, we would not have. This has catapulted us to be even better if we make the decision to say, I'm not gonna think negative and uh, forget about even thinking positive. I'm gonna think correctly and correct is, is don't let my emotions get into this and say this is an opportunity to learn, to achieve, and to get better. And so what do I need to do to help me thrive in this type of environment? And when you do that, you come out of it stronger. Yeah, and you know what's really interesting, and no names mentioned, but a second woman, both of them women in my coaching, uh, contracted the, uh, the virus, okay? One of them, she doesn't want anybody to know. Matter of fact, she had three closings and took two listings. Her husband was very sick, she very few symptoms, and was busy doing business while testing positive to the coronavirus. So you have everybody reacts differently and so forth. But I agree with you. You know, excuses are excuses. Well, I've had there. numerous conversations being uh, with sales executives being locked at home, right? Not leaving their house. In fact, one of the conversations was of how restrictive they've been, and they're doing business and they're having closings. So they haven't gone anywhere, and they're doing business. Um, if, you, if you're sitting there saying, well, can you really do virtual business that way? Absolutely. And that's some of the limiting beliefs we've mm. got to be careful of to say, well, it's never going to do that. I don't use that. I look at it overall. I'm a consumer, right? What do buyers and sellers want? And guess what, Mark? If they're going to want this coming out of this, all you have to worry about is how do you provide this where you didn't do it before? Yeah, Alberto was talking about he's got this 3D camera and... He sold two houses since this has started to people in California who didn't even leave their house and they bought homes here. Absolutely. So you can do that. Okay. So to wrap up and take your time with this too, you don't have to do it quickly. Um, you're a brand new agent or you want to go to the next level. What would be the three most important things you would tell them to focus on? Well, I think I covered, I mean, the biggest thing is, um, you know, meeting people daily. So you, whatever your plan is, what we call a DRC. Yep. Okay. Daily revenue commitment. I don't care if you're doing a hundred million a year or you're a brand new agent. Every single productive salesperson, even outside of our business, in my opinion, needs a DRC. Daily revenue commitment. Starts there. And, by the way, there's no wrong way. People sit there, well, I'm not into that. You don't have to be into that. It can be this. You know, some people, I want to build my business all on my sphere. Great, you can do that. You want to be growing your sphere and not just ha using this sphere and saying, I need to build my business on the same group again and again. They better come through for me. Not the right way to think. I'm going to support these people and, and I'm going to grow those relationships to more people over time. I want to do it just on open houses. Totally okay. I'm a door knocker. I like doing that. I like getting out of the office. Totally okay. I hate door knocking. I want to just do it by the phone. Totally okay. There's no wrong way as long as you got a daily revenue commitment and you're communicating with the public. So that's number one. The second uh, aspect is that's always been powerful for me is clarity. And, and the DRC is where I got that. That daily revenue commitment came from this idea of clarity. And that's what do you really want? You know, you hear this concept of What's your why? And don't get me wrong, that's important. But I want to even take it a little further. 
You know, sometimes what's my why gets lost in the clouds. You know, I want you to really get clear with yourself, and no one else can do this but you. What do you want to achieve? Why are you doing what you're doing? Okay, and once you have clarity on here's what I want to accomplish, you're unstoppable. And I have that ability for the organization, and I always had it for me personally too, even in my personal life. You know, could I be considered a control freak? Probably. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. But the whole point Diane. of that, that clarity has helped me. Let me give you one aspect of this. You know, I'll have investors come to me. You know, Mark, I want to maximize my return. And I always push back on that. They, I go, really, why? What do you mean, why? Okay, so to maximize your return, you're okay if we take this much risk, but the reward will be amazing if it works, but we'll take this much, but if you lose all your capital, you're okay too. Well, no, okay. So, so let's get clarity on what you really want. All right, what do you use? Well, this is gonna be part of my retirement. It's a, okay, so truthfully, after talking to them and really understanding, listening first, I say, you know what? Basically, I figured it out. A 7% return on everything you're doing would meet all your goals based on what you shared. Why would we want to take more risk than a 7% return if that's not truly what you want based on your actual needs and wants? So I'm very, I start with that clarity of what are you trying to accomplish? Once I understand that, then guess what? I put the activities in place, the activities, what we call uh, uh, um, lead measures, because lag measures are goals, very important, but they can't work alone. They have to have lead measures, which is the activities that accomplish whatever outcome you're trying to accomplish. And that starts with, I want to sell a lot of homes. That's not really an answer. That's not the an exact answer. Number. Correct. You want to say, I want to earn, and I'm making up a number, I want to earn $100,000, I want to earn a half a million, I want to take my business, I did $1.5 million in GCI, but you know what, I've been caught at this $1.5 million for four years, I want to do $2 million this year. What do I need to do to hit my $2 million? I love that kind of, of, of commitment because you can build a plan very specific plan, tying in that DRC, tying in what sales execs want to do to accomplish that goal. Yeah, and when you have that in your subconscious, you even start to act differently at an unconscious level too, if yeah. you have it in there. One last point the third, on that. Yeah, the third one, or, or the second one, okay. Okay. You still um, two? Okay, I think, was that two or one? Okay, well, let me just go on and you count. Um, <laughs> the, the, the other one is I, um, I am unoffendable. I am truthfully unoffendable. And I have to tell you, as simple as that may sound, uh, you know, and may she rest in peace, but you know, someone could say something negative about my mother and I'd be like, really, she's a really nice lady. I don't take that stuff personally. And here's the reason. What someone else is thinking, what someone else is saying, okay, you want me to manage that? You want that person to be able to control my thoughts and feelings? Ain't happening. Each individual has 60,000 thoughts going through their own head. I gotta manage those, that's tough enough. Now you want me to manage what you're saying? Look, whatever comes out of someone else's mouth is coming for their reasons. It may have validity to it, it may not, okay? And if someone shares something truthfully that's negative, all right, I wanna take that information in, I wanna evaluate it, and guess what? If I can be better with that feedback, awesome. If I say it has no validity and really I do not see where I'm doing that, I can ask someone, and don't get me wrong, I've asked someone, I don't think I'm doing that, am I? Yes, you are. Okay, good, that was great feedback. Okay, but don't take it personal. Just change. In this type of world, if anything that this coronavirus has taught us is you gotta be flexible. You gotta be willing to change and adjust your business, your thought process, your relationships, you know, um, how is it? Probably everybody at home, you know, with their spouses more often, with their kids, there's probably some stresses going on there, all right? Because it's a change. So you've gotta be really clear, have that clarity now. You know what? We're all dealing with this. There's gonna be frustrations there that probably, you know what, is coming from their own stuff. I'm not gonna take that personally. And, uh, and that's been a real powerful tool for me. I can listen 
uh, take it in, and then see where I need to adjust to be better. Okay, so DRC, clarity. Consistency, clarity and consistency right. are the one, and then don't take don't things be, personally. Don't take things personally. Okay, perfect, all right, good. So any final thoughts you wanna leave them with today? Um, here's what I'd like to say. First of all, I appreciate this opportunity. I hope this was valuable. Last thing I'd like to say is this, look, uh, as I said earlier, though this is not an environment any of, any of us would choose, I promise you, there's gonna be good that comes out of this environment. And I find focusing and looking for the good because I believe what we focus on expands, what we think about expands, and because that's true, and there's a zillion examples about that, I wanna focus on the good things and the things that I can be, you know, I can affect, I can help, and where I can be productive. So, we will get through this. This too shall end. I promise you, the world's not gonna fall off a cliff. And you know what? I truly do look forward to the future and I appreciate everyone's time.